All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Defenders of Wildlife's third Lunch and Learn webinar. I'm Maddie, and I'm delighted to be your host today. I'll be guiding us through the presentation, posting some trivia questions for you to have fun with, and I'll be introducing you to the members of our team who you'll be hearing from today. So I'm sure that many of us are now familiar with Zoom, but for those of us who are new to the platform, you'll notice some audio and video controls towards the bottom of your Zoom screen. We ask that you keep your audio muted and your video off during the presentation, though you can unmute yourself at the end of the presentation if you'd like to ask a question. Or if you prefer, you can ask questions or make comments in the chat box throughout our presentation. So Lunch and Learns are a monthly educational series that will continue to be offered by Defenders Southeast Field Team through Earth Day in April. These webinars will bring you up to speed on some of our most important projects and let you know how you can help. Today, we'll talk about marine wildlife, types of plastic pollution, including some that might be new to you, and how plastic pollution harms wildlife, and also how you can help to make a difference for wildlife everywhere. But first, to give us a brief overview of Defenders and what we do is Tracy Davids, our Southeast Program Coordinator based in Asheville, North Carolina, who, among other things, helps lead outreach efforts in the Southeast region, like this fantastic Lunch and Learn webinar series. Tracy, take it away. Thanks, Maddie. <clears throat> As members and supporters of Defenders, most of you already are familiar with our mission, but it bears repeating because it is big and bold and it underpins all the work that we do. We work to protect all native animals and plants in their natural communities. Our approach to this mission is direct and straightforward. We work on the ground, in the courts, and on Capitol Hill to protect and restore imperiled wildlife across the continent. Our work on the ground is the focus of our field conservation program that keeps us rooted in the communities that we serve, allows us to engage people in conservation, and implements practical solutions on the ground. It includes six field offices across the country, including Alaska, California, the Pacific Northwest, the Rockies and Plains, the Southwest, and here in the Southeast. And there is an excellent reason Defenders works in the Southeast, as any of you who live here know. We have mega biological diversity and with very few protected areas and a growing human population, this biodiversity faces many threats. Um, we have four focal landscapes that help us to prioritize the work that we do in the Southeast. The first is the Greater Everglades, home to the gopher tortoise, uh, home to Florida panthers and manatees. Then we have the Panhandle in Florida, which is home to the gopher tortoise and sea turtles. Next, we have the Southern Appalachians, home to amphibians and freshwater fish. And finally, the coastal plain, the Carolina coast, home to the critically endangered red wolf. So from the Appalachian mountains to the longleaf pine savannas of the coastal plain, to the river of grass called the Everglades, to the windswept dunes of the coast. This is the Southeast that we call home. And these are the people who are making it happen on your behalf. Let me introduce you to the members of the Southeast team from left to right. We have Kat Dearson based in Asheville, North Carolina. Elizabeth Fleming based in St. Petersburg, Florida. Christian Hunt, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Ben Prater, our director here in Asheville, North Carolina. Heather Clarkson on the call today in Durham, North Carolina. Kent Wimmer from Tallahassee, Florida. That is me in front uh, in Asheville, North Carolina. And not pictured uh, is our newest member of the team, Elizabeth Neville, who was with us for the presentation today. Uh, she is based in Winter Park, Florida. If you have any questions about Defenders and what we do, feel free to put them in the chat at any time. Um, and for now, I'm gonna turn it back over to Maddie, uh, who is going to launch a trivia question 
to introduce the next section of our presentation. Take it away, Maddie. Thanks, Tracy. All right, everyone. So I'm going to launch this polling question, like Tracy said, and excuse the alarms you may hear outside my window here, but I'm going to turn my volume up because everyone's going to need to listen and try to identify what sound this is. Let me launch the polling question and get ready for the sound. All right, so I'll give you guys a couple more seconds to decide what animal you think made that sound. All right, let's see how everyone did. Great job, everybody. That was a tricky one. So that was the endangered North Atlantic right whale, one of the many marine species that Defenders fights to protect. Now, with more information about marine wildlife, plastic pollution, and what you can do to help is Heather Clarkson, our Southeast Outreach Representative, who leads advocacy efforts for the critically endangered red wolf and a variety of other wildlife conservation projects in the coastal plain of the Carolinas. Heather, what else should we know about marine wildlife in our region? Thank you, Maddie. All right, guys. Um, thanks again for coming today. Um, go ahead. There you go. All right. So. There are a number of imperiled species in the oceans around the southeastern United States and the Gulf of Mexico. I have seen one comment or question in the, uh, the chat box asking if this also applies to um, areas in the northeastern part of the country, and, and the answer is yes. Um, while we are focusing on the southeast and the Gulf Coast for the purposes of this webinar, basically every bit of information we're about to give you is going to apply all over the country. Um, so here in the uh, Southeast in the Gulf of Mexico, we have a lot of species and those species in, or marine species include sea turtles like the green sea turtle and the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, nesting shorebirds like, and, and marine birds like the brown pelican and the piping plover in the least tern. We have marine mammals like manatees and dolphins or the newly identified rice's whale in the Gulf of Mexico. According to the United Nations, there are more than 800 species worldwide that are impacted by marine pollution and in, um, in the ocean. All right, back to you, Maddie. Hi, everyone. So it's time for our second trivia question. Let me launch this poll. All right, great job, everyone. So all of the answers provided were correct. So as you can tell, the plastic pollution crisis is a major issue for our planet and the fragile ecosystems that support the plethora of wildlife that defenders and our supporters work to defend. For more about plastic pollution, I'll turn it back over to Heather. Thanks again, Maddie. All right. Plastic pollution is the most widespread problem affecting the marine environment. It threatens ocean health, food safety and quality, human health, coastal tourism, and contributes to climate change. Each year, more than 300 million tons of plastic is produced worldwide. Half of this is used to design single use items such as shopping bags, cups, and straws. At least 8 million tons of that plastic ends up in our ocean every year. Floating plastic debris is currently the most abundant item of marine litter. Waste plastic makes up 80% of all marine debris from surface waters to deep sea sediments. This pollution can be land-based or ocean-based, but most of the pollution is actually land-based. Under the influence of solar UV radiation, wind, currents, and other natural factors, plastic breaks down into very small particles. We call those particles microplastics. Microplastics have been identified in tap water, beer, salt, and are present in all samples collected from the world's oceans, including the Arctic Ocean. All right, what's a nurdle? Uh, I'm not sure, but I imagine most of you have not heard of a nurdle. A nurdle is a plastic pellet which serves as raw material in the manufacturing of most plastic products. They are about the size of a lentil. Nurdles are often spilled in transport between manufacturing locations. Nurdles are washing up on our beaches by the millions. Nearly 75% of all litter, all beach litter is plastic. Nurdle pellets can absorb harmful chemicals 
and then they are ingested by birds, fish, and sea turtles. Nurdles can block intestinal tracts and cause death. All right, back to Maddie for another trivia question. Thanks, Heather. All right, so let me go ahead and launch the third trivia question. So by reducing the amount of single use plastic we consume, we can, and I'll give you guys a couple more seconds to decide. Great job, everyone. That was an easy one. And all of you can see that by choosing to act consciously for the planet and wildlife, we can each make meaningful differences in our own unique way to catalyze positive change. Now back to Heather for some information about how you can make a difference. Thanks, Maddie. All right, um, so how can you guys help at home? So the first thing we're gonna talk to you guys about today is the Nurdle Patrol. Um, and then after that, as we all know, reduce, reuse, recycle, support policies aimed at reducing plastic use, organize or join a cleanup effort, and simply spread the word about plastic pollution. So the Nurdle Patrol is a citizen science project founded by the Mission Aransas National Estuarine Research Reserve at the University of Texas Marine Science Institute in Port Aransas, Texas. The Nurdle Patrol started in November 2018 after a large number of plastic pellets washed up on Mustang and North Padre Islands in Texas during September of that year. The project seeks to gather information about where, where nurdles are located, remove the nurdles from the environment, and create awareness about the nurdle issue. Since then, nurdle patrol projects have sprung to life across the country, highlighting the wide ranging problem of nurdle pollution. The Nurdle Patrol conducts 10 minute surveys along beaches, riverbanks, and lake shorelines to identify high concentrations of nurdles and help find the source. So who are we looking for? You! Um, the Nurdle Patrol is open to anyone able and willing to conduct surveys along the beach. If you live at the beach or you travel to the beach often, this is something you can definitely help out with. Um, I'll let you take a quick look at this slide and then we will have more information about how to get involved with Nurdle Patrol at the end of this presentation. Now, here to talk to us more about the actions you can take at home, I'd like to introduce Liz Neville, Neville Defender's new Senior Gulf Coast Representative. Liz advocates to protect aquatic and coastal species and habitat in Florida and along the Gulf Coast of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana as our Senior Representative for the Gulf Coast. She's responsible for leading Defender's work to restore Florida's Ocklawaha River, an important project for the Florida manatee and other native species. All right, Liz, your turn. Thank you so much, Heather. Here, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some things that you as an individual can do to reduce your impact on plastic pollution. Now, I think we're all familiar with the phrase reduce, reuse, recycle, but it's really important to know that that indicates a priority of these actions. The most important thing is to reduce the amount of plastic that you use in your day-to-day -day life, such as opting for plastic-free packaging, avoiding products with microbeads, and eliminating single-use plastics like straws, and reusing plastic objects that you can't avoid that might still have some life in them. One example that I like to implement, and of course this was a little bit more applicable before the pandemic, is I would reuse takeout containers and keep one in my purse when I would go to restaurants to take my leftovers home in. Finally, while recycling is not going to be the solution to the problem entirely, it does help. Currently, only 9% of plastic is recycled worldwide. It's really important to recycle properly. Read the labels and clean the items before putting them in the bin. The numbers, for example, you know, if you look in the little recycle symbol, you'll see a one, two, three, four, or five, correspond with the items that your local recycling will take. So make sure to check your local rules. Finally, when, when available, buy objects that have been recycled already. I also recommend getting thrifty. You can thrift items like clothes and household goods, and that helps reduce plastic pollution. Finally, there's some really amazing companies out there that are doing their parts to reduce the plastic crisis. Loop is an interesting one. Um, it's a partnership with Kroger, and you can get items like, um, like haagen ice cream, Tide cleaning products, and they come in reusable packaging that you can send back to the company. The package-free store has goods like reusable straws and cleaning products for your home. 
New Nomads is an interesting company. It's a clothing store, but everything they ship comes in biodegradable packaging that can be composted in a home composter. And finally, Drops is a really amazing cleaning company that is cost effective and also uses zero waste products and packaging. Finally, engaging in public policy is a really important piece to reducing plastic pollution. Supporting local communities and enacting single use bag vans and items like plastic bags makes a big difference for wildlife like sea turtles who often eat plastic bags mistaking them for jellyfish. Finally, as Heather mentioned, nurdles are a tremendous issue and some states are working to improve laws regarding how nurdles are handled and what happens after a spill. So keep an eye out for those initiatives. Lastly, clean it up. When you see plastic trash, please pick it up and dispose of it properly. If you're ready to get started by joining the Nurdle Patrol or engaging in other initiatives, please contact us at Southeast Field Office at defenders.org. Back to you, Maddie, for our final trivia question. Thanks, Liz. All right, everyone. So this is our final trivia question, and it's not a trivia question per se, but you'll see when I launch this poll. Which of these actions are you personally willing to take to protect marine wildlife and lessen your plastic usage? For this one, unlike the others, you can choose as many as you want. And I'll give you guys probably 30 seconds to go ahead and figure out what you would like to do. All right. So great job, everybody. This looks wonderful. I hope you can all see the results that I've shared with you. It looks like everybody is really willing to do their part to alleviate this plastic pollution crisis. And we really appreciate your dedication to defending wildlife. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And then we will open the floor up for any questions that have been posted in the comment box. Tracy has been monitoring the chat throughout the presentation. So Tracy, are there any questions in the chat box to kick us off? Yeah, we do have a few, Maddie. Um, let me start with the first one, uh, which is a really good question. Do microplastics come from laundry pods? I can take that one. Um, the answer is very simply yes. Microplastics come from literally every form of plastic um, that, that there is. You know, like we explained earlier, there's a number of natural processes that begin to break those plastics down into um, even smaller and smaller particles over time. So they never really leave the environment. Thank you. And uh, Heather, I wanted to quickly piggyback on that too, um, on the laundry question. That's really important that you raise that because it's not just the laundry packs, but it's also our clothing items themselves. Um, synthetics like um, activewear, for example, are a really big contributor to plastic pollution. There was a study down in my home state of Florida. It's a really big problem here. And one thing you can do actually in your home is there's this really cool product called a guppy friend. And it's a bag that you can put your synthetic clothing in when you put it into the wash and it catches the microfibers before they get into the water stream and you clean them out manually. I'll put that name in the chat if anyone's interested. And to be clear, none of these are paid sponsors. These are just companies that we've come across that we think are doing the right thing. Good question, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, we have another one. Um, hi, I wanna be a climatologist when I grow up. How does plastic pollution affect climate change? That's a great question. I couldn't tell if, if Liz was about to take herself off mute to, to handle this one. Um, so the, the biggest way that plastic pollution affects climate change is not so much in the pollution itself, but in the creation of the plastic. Um, all plastic is, is made from petroleum. So it through the creation of plastic and the harvesting of petroleum, we're running into the same issues as we are with any other petroleum based product. Thank you, Heather, you hit the nail on the head. It's just, um, you know, from really cradle to grave, there are environmental issues associated. And as you pointed out, the climate, the climate change aspect comes from all aspects, as well as shipping too. That's an important piece is that a lot of energy and climate harm comes from shipping products worldwide. So that's another piece of this. It's important to um, keep in mind as well on the importance of shopping local. We have another question in the chat box. Um, how do you identify the difference between a nurdle and a small rock? It's a good question. That is a really good question. Um, the, the, your nurdle is going to be, and it, it will be a little hard to tell at that small, small scale, but your nurdle is going to be more lightweight. Um, also, when you hold the nurdles up to the light, they tend to be, they can be translucent. 
Um, so you can see that, and, and I do apologize, we actually had a really close up Nerdle photo that didn't make it into the presentation. Um, but they they have a, a very plasticky dullness to them. Um, they're, they're pretty obviously when you put them up against like a, a piece of rock or a piece of sand or shell, it's very clear that the nurdles themselves are plastic. But that's a really good question because they are so, so tiny. Um, they're very insidious. They get into everything. Great question. Um, do folks have any other questions for the team? Uh, those are all the questions that we had in the chat. Um, you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask it. Um, but if you're shy and you want to just put it in the chat box, that's fine too. This is an opportunity to ask any question that you have about this program or Defenders. So Tracy, I'm seeing that Pamela asked if there were any West Coast Nurdle patrols. Um, oh. That's a really good question. So. As far as defenders goes, we are organizing nurdle patrols specifically in the Carolinas and then um, the southern Gulf Coast in Texas. But the um, the port of and I'm I'm smiling because I mess up this name every time. The Port Aransas National Estuarine Research Center in Texas. Um, that's where the nurdle patrol was really created. And so they would be the ones who would know who was doing it on the West Coast. Um, if you have an interest in doing this as a Defenders um, program, I'm more than happy to put whoever in touch with our, our California team. And it's very likely that they'll be wanting to get on board as well. Heather, someone asked um, if they do the survey, I'm assuming that's the Nurdle Patrol, where do, we, where do they send the results? Very good question. So, um, it's all online and there's actually a portal on um, the Mission Aransas website that allows you to go in and submit your exact location, your NERDL numbers um, and, and um, other details. So I, I was remiss in mentioning, we're gonna have a training in um, April for NERDL patrols. Uh, we'll be preparing for the summer season when people are starting to get back to the beaches, um, socially distanced, of course, but we will have a virtual training for any um, folks who want to get involved in the Carolinas or in Texas um, to help us in our priority areas. Um, if there are people who want to get really involved outside of our priority areas, I'm, I'm more than happy to connect you um, either with our teams or teams that are already doing it in your areas. Um, and you can use that email address that we, we threw up and um, it will be sent to you as well as a follow up to this meeting. But you can contact us through that email address Tracy will send it to me and I can hook you up with whoever or put you on the waiting list um, for our, our April, um, I think we're doing it Earth Week. So Earth Week uh, training session. Yeah, and I also put it in the chat. Oh, so thank you. if you have access to that, you can get that email address now. Um, we have another question. Is there any curriculum that can be integrated into K through 12 education on this topic? Wow. Yes, do you know? I'm sure there is, um, but I would have to hunt for that because I don't know personally. Elizabeth, do you know any groups who are doing K through 12 curriculums? You know, I don't, but that is a really interesting question and worthy of follow-up. So thank you for posting that. And I actually wanted to respond to a couple of comments that have come up in the chat that weren't phrased as questions per se, but I'm too to thank Marie as well as Debbie and the gang of fur both raised the really important issue of derelict fishing gear and the contribution that it causes to plastic pollution. Thank you for pointing that out. It is really important. And you know, I'm fairly new in my role as you know a Gulf Coast representative, but I just want you to know that I've worked on this issue with other organizations in the past. And um, it is one of my priorities to look at fisheries reform and how the really tremendous issue of derelict fishing gear can be addressed. And I'm vegan as well. And I definitely understand that personal change is a big piece of this and um, personal and policy change go hand in hand. So thank you for doing your parts. Thanks for that comment, Liz. Are there any other questions from folks on the call that you'd like to ask or any uh, comments? I have a question. This is Leslie from Virginia. Um, has Defenders worked with any of the food packaging um, companies to get them to stop using a lot of the netting that they put produce in? 
Um, I know I try cutting it all into 50 million pieces when I get it home, um, but I'm sure there are a lot of other people that don't do that. And like the Coke bottles and the Pepsi bottles that are, you know, hooked together with plastics and you have to cut through them. Is Defenders working on anything like that? Hey, um, so not to my knowledge, um, at least not in the Southeast, um, but one thing that we have found, uh, you know, this kind of goes back to Liz's comment about personal change, um, that if we change, and, and we do recognize that the responsibility should not be all on the consumer, um, but if we change our habits, the organizations, the corporations are, are likely to change theirs as well. Um, so this is one of those situations where we would, we would more advocate for taking your own reusable bag to the produce section, um, shopping from a farmer's market, Thing, you know, going to places and spending your money at stores or, or markets that are already reducing their waste, um, as opposed to trying to force the big box stores to conform. So Ethan just asked a question. Oh. <laughs> where, um, where exactly does bio, biodegradable packaging come from? And should we worry about using too many trees for cardboard or paper? Um, that's a really, really good question. And and that kind of gets to, I think, an existential question that comes up a lot in conservation of, you know, can we overuse these, these more bio-friendly, biodegradable um, materials like plants and paper? And I think that there, there is obviously a definite risk of that. Um, but, it, you know, if you consider at least the life cycle of the tree, as it goes through its life, it is sequestering carbon. Now, of course, that carbon gets released later on, but we're not, it's more of a cycle. It's more of an in and an out as opposed to using synthetic products and, and doing nothing but creating more emissions. Um, and again, that, that's a really nuanced question um, <laughs> that we all argue about, I think, in every realm of um, habitat conservation, <laughs> at least in my experience. Um, but it's a really good question. and. And I think it bears a lot of, of consideration as we move forward and, and trying to replace our plastic use with, you know, biodegradable fibers. Also, are there groups in Pennsylvania that work to improve recycling that we can recommend? Um, offhand, I don't know. Do you, Heather or Elizabeth? That's something that um, we can look into and get back to you on. Yeah, I don't. Um, but again, you know, I'm in Durham, so Pennsylvania is a little out of my wheelhouse. Um, you know, we can definitely dig into that for you if you want to shoot us a follow up email um, or we can point you towards some of the more the local organizations who are actively working to make these things happen on like a community scale. And someone is asking for um, advice on how to convince waste companies to properly recycle. Any advice? Make it worth their while. In fact, your local engagement is so, so important. And I know that it can be really difficult, especially in COVID times, but a lot of these decisions are made at the county or municipal level. So writing to your local representatives is a really important place to start and be persistent is something that I would point out from personal experience as well. You know, as we pointed out though, it's, um, and this kind of goes back to the question about cardboard and um, recycling is so tricky because as we know, only 9% gets recycled. So it's a really important piece of the question, but it also gets into the question of degrees or of harm and resources. And um, as we discussed, seeing that some um, recycled material or I guess plastic materials are first reduced and then reused, I think is really important. So integrating all aspects of that, but definitely engaging at the local level in terms of recycling and also making um, options available like composting and such is really important. And I'll, I'll add to that really quickly. You know, one thing that has always surprised me when I started working in, in the, the realm of, of public interest, um, despite being for a, a private organization is, you know, often at the local level, there's not a lot of public engagement. Um, and you would be amazed of what you can learn and the influence you can have by just starting to go to county commission meetings or city council meetings. Um, 
when when your local leadership starts seeing the same faces every single time in their meetings, they will start to pay attention and they will get the point that you care. Um, so I, I really encourage all of you, if you want to make local community level change, start going to those meetings, introducing yourself and talking about the issues every single time you're there. Thank you, Heather. Um, any ideas on how to get better enforcement of existing litter laws? I think um, that goes right back to the, the question we just answered. Um, if, you, if you aren't showing up to those meetings and demanding that these laws be enforced, then they probably won't be. Um, that really does, I've noticed, vary by by area. Uh, it might be vary by state. It could even just vary by your town. Some towns are very, very, very good about keeping, you know, their areas litter free while others are not. Um, and, I, and I don't know what that really speaks to, but the best way to get that issue in front of your leadership and the people who can make a change is, is to show up to the meetings. And, and, you know, I never want to advocate for complaining, but, you know, someone else is going to take their issue to your leadership. So you might as well take your own issue there and make sure that you're getting heard. Thank you. Yes, I agree, Pat. Show up and speak up. <laughs> yes. Any other questions for the team? Feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask it. Hi y'all, my name's David and sorry for joining late. Um, the thing that I keep seeing is that local, local state governments and the populace in general think that whenever there's waste that's involved that the industry should not be responsible for cleaning up their own messes and not to advertise as though they are. And I don't know if y'all spoke about it, but I was listening to PBR the other day, um, or public radio, and they were talking about how, not the Pro Bull Writing Association. And so, <laughs> so what um, I was hearing was that the, in the 70s is when we started seeing the first recycling symbols on the bottoms of containers and such and how that even though it said that these were recyclable, that was part of the 90% that really wasn't. And so them having propagated that and spent the money to make that a belief in the general populace, they are now beginning to start another campaign, if you will, saying that plastics, first use, uh, single use plastics are the way to go. And so what is it that we can do to hold these industries accountable for the waste that they produce that they have so conveniently made us, I'm, I'll use the word dependent for lack of a better word, I mean, when you go to the store and you want to buy Gatorade, you can buy the, the, the one that makes 25 gallons and dole it out yourself. But most folks go in and grab because they need it at that moment. So how do we get industry responsible for the things that they create and spend the money that they would have been using to Prop, create propaganda and to create a state of mind in the general populace in actually trying to solve the problem. Liz, you wanna take that one? Sure. Um, David, thank you so much for that thoughtful, you know, I guess, set of questions and thoughts. And it really highlights a really important piece of this, in my opinion, which is that the plastics crisis is a systemic global issue and it's politically enforced, especially in this country. And you really hit on the head that, um, you, like I said, personal choices are really important, you know, to reduce the amount of plastic that we're responsible for. But there is an aspect of this that is, um, you know, it's constrained by our, what we have available at our fingertips based on income, based on what's available here. I know where I live, I'm in the Orlando area in Florida. It's really a minority of grocery stores and such where 
produce without plastics is available. And I think that the pandemic has made things even more difficult with the emphasis on sanitation. So thank you for highlighting that. You know, I think we're still figuring out the answers to that. My understanding is that there is some federal legislation percolating, which would and put greater responsibility on the plastics industry. But, um, you know, I don't unfortunately know the status of that right now. But I think it's a piece where um, politicians are going to have to hold industry accountable, you know, from cradle to grave by, you know, putting reasonable limits on extraction, on production, and on what happens after. Um, so I think it's something that's going to have to be shown by both the will of the people and a will of leaders. And it's going to be a complex issue. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, and I just really am so proud of everyone here who's doing their part. And I encourage you to keep doing it, even though the issue can seem insurmountable at times. Hey, Tracy, this is Kent Wimmer in Northwest Florida. How are you doing today? Hey, I just, I wanted to add that uh, there's actually a bill in Florida that it's not dealing with plastic, but it's dealing with one of the most prominent things pollution found on beaches, and that is cigarette butts. And so there's actually a bill proposed that would regulate smoking in public beaches, um, in public places, including beaches and parks. So there is some good language. There is some good proposals out there that uh, can help clean up our beaches. So just wanted to contribute that. If you're interested in looking it up, it's uh, Senate Bill 334. 334. Thank you, Kent. I've got a comment, but I don't know if you guys can see me. Um, my yes. name is, you can't? Okay, great. My name is Hadley, and I just want to throw out a thought. There's a group called meetup.com, M-E-E-T-U-P dot C-O-M com. I'm quite literally thinking I'm going to join that group and make a group within that, which invites literally anybody in this area to join called Reduce, Reuse, and Recycle, because the county that I live in here in Pennsylvania only recycles 35%. And I've done a lot of research in terms of what's going on locally, but there's also um, frustration regarding apartment complexes and also how there should be recycle bins by bus stops in all honesty. There's so many different places that could use some improvement type situation. So I just want to throw out the idea if you go to meetup.com, maybe make a group in your area called, in my case, Reduce, Reuse, Recycle and invite everybody in the neighborhood to hopefully join this group and go for it in your area. I just wanted to throw that out. Thanks. Thank you, Hadley. Appreciate that. Folks, we've got five more questions before the end of this webinar. Are there any other questions for the team? All right. Hearing none, I guess it is time for our uh, random drawing to see who wins the Defenders of Wildlife uh, prize pack. And the winner of the prize pack is Pat Pierce. Uh, Pat, if you are still on this call, uh, please put your email address in the chat um, and I will get in touch with you about where to send your Defenders Prize Pack. I wanna thank everybody for showing up today, for being interested in this topic, uh, for asking really great questions and being engaged and uh, for doing your part to reduce plastic consumption and pollution um, to help clear our oceans from this really terrible problem. Um, we appreciate all that you do and all of your support and hope that you will consider joining us next month uh, for our wildlife workshop and webinar, Lunch and Learn um, on Florida Panthers, living with Florida Panthers. Uh, that will be our topic next month. Um, and in April, we'll be back with Liz Neville, who is going to talk about uh, the Ocklawaha, freeing the Ocklawaha River um, and helping to protect manatees. So we hope that you will join us for those webinars as well. Uh, we will be sending out a follow-up email that will include a recording of this webinar so that you'll have that and you'll be able to share that link with family and friends who couldn't make it today. And we'll also include in that email uh, links to other um, uh, information and resources that we provided in the presentation. Thank you.